Hello, everyone, and welcome to Roll Call. Um, my name is Kayla McNabb. I use she, her pronouns, and I'll be your host for this evening. Um, we do not have Roscoe Highland with us. Uh, he was lost during the game that this session is based on, and so he will not be with us this evening. We are here in remembrance of him, though. But actually, just that's Griffin fake somberness. It. It's not real. <laughs> right. huh? Actually, Griffin just couldn't make it. <laughs> yeah, Griffin just had something come up. That's okay. You know. uh, <laughs> so this session is uh, in uh, kind of response to our The Open Boat one shot from January 29th. Uh, so The Open Boat by Stephen Crane. Uh, and we will be doing a session like this after each episode of Roll of Play uh, as a place for us to talk about the story and for us to talk about the experience of playing in that session. Uh, if you have questions for the folks on our panel this evening, please put them in the chat uh, or feel free to tweet them at us with the hashtag VTUL Roll Call. We'll be checking those throughout the show and um, we'd love to answer your questions if you have any. Uh, we'll start by having each person remind the audience who Trevor's they are. Not pointing at anything. <laughs> and the characters that they played. I mean, the chat is, it depends on what your platform is. Sure. Down or over, I'm not sure. It depends on your platform. Well, you know where chat is. Put your questions I'm just, there, please. I'm just going to, I'm just in my mental head canon. <laughs> Trevor's just doing a dance. <laughs> <laughs> that involves pointing. That's also that's also fairly common. That's yeah. fair. That's fair. Oh man. Uh, let's oh, but see yeah, here. you were saying so. something, and I derailed us. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fair. Um, so, who are you? Other people on the panel, and which character did you play? That's a great question. <laughs> who am I? Uh, we're gonna start with the existentialism early. Right. Yeah. You want me to go first? Sure. Since You're on started. the top on the um, ah, on the okay. thing, so. I am Jonathan it. Bradley. I'm head of studios and innovative technologies for the University Libraries. I use he, him pronouns, and I was the GM for this session. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Kira. Very good. Hello. And Trevor. Uh, I'm Trevor Finney. I am the Creative Services Coordinator and Twitch Stream Dancer at the mm -hmm. University Libraries. Um, I played uh, Bernard, just Bernard. I left my past behind when I got on that boat. We don't need to be dug digging it up now. Um, I was the cook and probably the, the, uh, the most food important character. Uh, mm -hmm. and was constantly being betrayed by that, which I assume we'll get into. Um, I love ham sandwiches and pie, and um, I'm excited to be here. So Bernard much... loves ham sandwiches and pie. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. We got a deep dive uh, how, into your past. So how much of your job description percentage-wise is dancing on Twitch? <laughs> um <laughs> Well, hoping well, we're, I'm hoping to bring it up to about fifteen percent. So, oh, okay. multiple hours a week. I'm not on this channel that much, so um, yeah. a lot of it is just spent practicing. Um, sure. But well, as you saw earlier, um, I mean, very any good invested. any good task takes a lot of prep before you get to the actual work. I mean, it's that's true. So we don't see that part of it. You don't see the behind the scenes. And absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's refreshing I mean, so to have that transparency, for sure. Right. Um, it looks like we've got some audio issues with Kira. Uh, if I think I may have just fixed them. Okay. okay. If folks in the chat can give us a high sign if uh, 
things are good and we could i'll just endlessly talk about things <laughs> for a good 10 seconds so people have an opportunity to figure it Make out sure okay cool. we have levels excellent right. excellent all right uh and the other two on our boat were uh roscoe highland uh the oiler uh who is not able to be with us this evening and uh i was jesse newton use they them pronouns the captain um you know did their best uh and it wasn't good enough so that's something that i have to bring to this conversation I mean, it's unfortunate I mean, survived. <laughs> yeah but it wasn't good enough <laughs> okay. it's definitely a little bossy and not a lot of doing work yeah well that's you know <laughs> captaining um yeah had a had a whole backstory uh did survive so there's that um so i got a whole front story a future <laughs> ready <laughs> well <laughs> sure that is what it means to survive is that you get to have a future story as well that is, that is true um i would say they were racked with guilt for the rest of their career mm. so mm. that is you know m partially because they were so close to all making yeah. it you know if you all of the folks who were lost at sea when the boat went down we can't do anything about that i mean ignoring that was all the outside I mean, of I their think control explosion. <laughs> right yeah just exactly just the four of you on that boat the yeah ship. right yeah they jesse <laughs> could have moved on from that okay but <laughs> but then we got close on the boat that's right and i think we should definitely talk about later the fact that some of us probably shouldn't have been alive at the end <laughs> some of you were real close <laughs> and managed to, to, not, to scrape by to not being alive at the end <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, that's definitely, um, I definitely want to get into that. Um, let's see here. We have been starting with questions that folks have for each other or for the DM about the game. Does anybody have anything in that kind of realm that we might want to start with? And I'll double check our... I got a question. Uh, yeah, oh, okay. I do want to ask a question. Oh, <laughs> uh, my question is... Jonathan, why the open boat? Um, it's, it's a nice, dark, depressing mm, story. That's a question. <laughs> I, I love Stephen Crane. I mean, it's an easy, <laughs> it's an easy question to answer. No, so um, you know, we have a behind the scenes. This is the how the sausage is made, or whatever. We have a a long spreadsheet that just has works of literature, and um, I did sort of like an initial bulk dump of things in there. And to do that, I walked through my house and looked at all of my literature that I've collected over the yes. years of being an English major and sort of looked at each one and said, would this be good for like a uh, a D&D slash role-playing one-shot? And the open boat... I was like, there is a story, there is a narrative here that has like an action that people could make decisions to and affect some sort of outcome. Like, it's essentially like a little mini adventure. All that being said, uh, I think it was in my notes as going to be rough. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, it also uh, all takes place basically on a boat. Yeah, which, is which not that, a dinghy. yeah, not even a yeah. boat, like a dinghy. Yeah. That, <laughs> I mean, that segues well into the question I had, which was, "Did y'all have fun?" Because I was really <laughs> worried we weren't going to have fun when I went into it. <laughs> um, without, I mean, I would say I, these are probably questions that that Kayla would normally ask as the host or answer as a player as well. Maybe I'm jumping ahead, but um, because I was familiar with this work, I was really interested in playing this and thinking about what it was going to mean to play an entire game in like a 10 foot or like a, you know, 12 foot square <laughs> or a 16, whatever, whatever the math would be on a dinghy. Um, I was like, what are the mechanics of this even going to be? Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. there's literally nowhere to go except the ocean. Yeah. I was worried <laughs> Which about was that. bad. I, Real bad. I have to say, I, I had no idea what I was going to expect because I, I, I hadn't read the story, I don't think, um, until right before we played. And then I, I listened to it on audiobook. Um, and um, I was like, this is this seems perfect because, as you said, it's like it's like a it's only it was about an hour and a half on audiobook. So it was a really short read. Um, 
and it was kind of fun uh as like this little um yeah little mini adventure this 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 thing um i also think that a lot of like one shots work really well when you just like kind of drop right into the middle of them and i thought you did a really good job with that but i definitely with when we were starting out i was like i have no idea how he's gonna turn um like this this just like being stranded on a dinghy for days and days and then eventually getting to shore into like a compelling game and i um and then so i was very delighted and it was really fun for me as a player whenever it was like when the birds came for the food and i was like that's perfect because i was like i I don't think we're going to be fighting mermaids or anything i don't think you're going to change the story that much but uh yeah so that was it was it was really fun yep well you know (laughs) Yeah, I would I would definitely um, definitely agree with that. I think in trying to design and think through some of these one shots, uh, like watching Jonathan do it, um, trying to figure out like you can only actually have so many encounters. Like there's only so much time in a one shot before mm-hmm. it's not a one shot anymore. Um, <laughs> And it's a much smaller <laughs> amount of time than like you think it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I thought that the, the game that you put together, Jonathan did a good job of kind of walking that line. Like there was enough, uh, I guess trials that we had to get through, but it wasn't, um, didn't, didn't feel like there were things coming at us all the time because a lot of mm. being stranded on a dinghy would just be sitting there trying not to freeze or starve to death. Yeah. Um, you know. But, but it also wasn't like four hours of the four of us sitting there staring at each other <laughs> right. trying to make awkward conversation right. because nothing was happening. It's true. Yeah, yeah that, was, yeah. that was also a concern I had, which is why I asked if that had fun. Could have been real boring. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, so yeah. for like context... Um, also behind the scenes this this one shot came together very fast much faster than a lot of our other ones have and it came together that quickly because we we sort of came back from winter break and we had planned sort of roughly to go ahead and do the sequel to the alice in wonderland one but we ended up having to delay that one due to scheduling conflicts and stuff so we basically this one came together in like a week um and the only reason why it came together in a week is because it's the open boat and because of all the things that you said was like, there was a point when I was putting it together and I was like, there are no NPCs in this story. Like there are only player characters. And unless you're going to count well, like the birds. bird, yeah. the bird, there like, were, lands, yeah, there was the gull <laughs> that lands on you as like an NPC. Then like, and I was like, so, you know, it's going to be y'all. Like, y'all are going to have to make this story because you won't, uh, unlike most games, you're not going to be able to rely on me to be over here, like, being a funny character or, like, doing something (laughs) ridiculous or just being, like, a mean villain or something. There's, like, nothing else, there's nothing from me for you to really play on except the events, which you get anyways in a normal D&D game, but you also normally get some other characters who know things that you don't and you are trying to figure out or something that there's there's something there to engage with and that was gone and so i was like it's gonna be challenging it's gonna be weird but um i i I knew you all were experienced players so i was like i feel like they're up for it but um probably gonna be a session that they're not not used to playing in this way (laughs) yeah definitely was different than some of the other sessions that we've had um for sure right um let's see do we want to talk about that a little bit first maybe since we've had what have we had so far we've had dungeons and dragons fifth edition we've had honey heist we've had uh the what is it the black cat gaming spy game spy game yeah, based on 5th edition. Um, and this was a totally different thing. Yeah, so, I mean, it's sort of based on another RPG that I've run, um, uh, based on Labyrinth, the the 1980s Jim Henson, yes. David Bowie, uh, just B 
being amazing. Uh, Just say the greatest movie of all time, <laughs> okay, and people will know what you talking about. Summer, yeah. <laughs> um, and there, there's a there's a um, RPG from uh, I think it's River Horse Games that they released that's based on that, and it's a very like low white rules light uh, style of game. And when I was thinking about this, there was a moment where I pondered having you all make like level one fighters essentially because you're all soldiers and so it's sort of except for the correspondent <laughs> and and yeah, I, I was gonna say i wasn't <laughs> but then i was also sort of like i don't know that's a lot to make up even a level one character in D D for mm-hmm. a bunch of stuff that you are ne- you're not gonna use like none of this stuff yeah. matters um and so i was like I'm, i really could just adapt that model over to this to make things like real low barriers especially since this has got to come together in a week yeah i thought it made perfect sense i really liked i haven't played too many of those style um game systems before where they're like really that that simplified um and i mean that's about as simple as it gets where i think you know i had poor balance and good constitution and the way that you played that was if you've got good constitution you get advantage if you got poor balance you get disadvantage otherwise you roll a d6 and you see what you get and i thought that was a really great way to like pare down all of those extra mechanics because you're totally right making a 5e character for something that was going to be this simple um would just have been kind of grueling um uh and yeah i thought i thought it worked really well um and it also it increased the amount of um like it it increased it dramatically increased the amount of worth that some characters had at certain tasks and it really increased the amount of like luck that the game had where like D and D five E really tries to balance the luck versus progression. And, you know, late game, it really is. It's like, it's a very little percentage of luck for a lot of things that you try to do mm-hmm. if it's in your like domain. Um, and I thought having so much of this be luck based, um, felt really fun it because we really didn't know it wasn't there was no guarantee for anything that was going to happen the way you wanted it to um so i thought that was really interesting and really cool to see a totally different system that's just much more simplified yeah i mean we've been pondering this we actually talked about it even before we started doing these shows was like what are we going to do whenever somebody runs a game and it just really doesn't make sense for them to make a D &D like like that's just too much for what they're going to be doing. Like the story Mm. is just not going to really need an adventurer to Mm. complete it. You just need someone who can make some decisions and maybe has some things they're good at. And really the labyrinth thing just fell in my lap. And it it is, it is also, I've seen other systems out there that do that same sort of mechanic. I mean, it's not really that different than honey heist. It's a D six. Sometimes you're better. Sometimes you're worse, Yep. which honey heist has the like back and forth, mechanic which is really fun for honey heist between mm-hmm. being a bear and a criminal um but i mean yeah well it gives you another thing to balance and in the yeah. open boat we already had something to balance and it was literal balance staying in a boat it was literally <laughs> the was, boat yeah. <laughs> literal balance. Yeah. yeah there's also i've seen um other systems uh i don't know if this is getting too off topic but i've seen other systems um where um you know it's it's a d6 and then how much you've skilled up in that thing you just get mm-hmm. more d6s so mm-hmm. you and then you just need a certain number of successes and that's the difficulty so it's like every role has a difficulty of five and you need to do a really impressive feat you need three successes so you better hope that you've got a lot of d you've got a big dice pool um, mm-hmm. but it's amazing how quickly just those small additions to the game mechanics really spiral out to become something just way more complex. Um, This is the first time, I think this is the most pared down and simplified RPG system that I've played. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think this kind of structure, right, where you have something like defined that you're good at, something defined that you're not good at and then everything else is just like are you going to be able to like do it you got whatever the difficulty is it's it it's chance um is interesting because it also invites some 
uh, additional role play, right? Like if it's like, can I figure out a way to argue that this thing that I'm doing is leadership? Like, <laughs> Which I, if I'm bossing people right. around, does that count as leadership? Mm-hmm. I always enjoy hearing those arguments too, even though sometimes I'm like, no, <laughs> no, uh, they're always fun to hear because I mean it's 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 players engaging with their character. I think that's like the <laughs> most fun. That some of the most fun I have in role playing games is really trying to bend those rules to fit what I want to do, and mm-hmm. you know, like you know, I. I love playing like spellcasters usually in games that aren't based on um, uh, <laughs> people. A natural people story from natural, the early yeah. 20th century boat yeah, stories. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just a cook. Um, but yeah, but you know, I really love stringing those like skills together and, and trying to find ways to, to, yeah, I don't know, like get extra stuff out of them. So this, as you were saying, Kayla, you're totally right of this thought of like, is that good constitution? Could I have, could I have pitched it that way? I wonder, I don't think I did that quite enough. Um, but from where I sat, I was like, that's a great leader. Everything they're doing is good leadership. <laughs> but that's because you were Bernard the cook and that was the captain. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> of course you're going to listen to the well, captain. Yeah. Like when, you know, when you pick me up and you give me a job and you don't ask too much, too many questions about my background. Yeah. Like a last I name. made you a good meal. Right. Yeah. Like a last name. <laughs> Yeah. Nobody needs Look, those. Uh, you you buy fine. a lot of loyalty that way. <laughs> At least with Bernard. Sure. So, sure. I mean, I think all these sentiments also extend to, like, even sort of more complex, like, role playing games. Because, like, sure. I'm always. I have sort of tried to make a conscious effort if I'm D- D&D, like, uh, gaming. GMing a like D&D 5e <laughs> campaign. I don't know why that word was so hard. Also. Word. Yeah. Word um, salad. <laughs> to whenever like a skill check comes up, to just be like, I'm willing to take this. I'm willing to take that. And even then, I'm still probably willing to take some other types of skills if somebody will make an argument to me because, um, I mean, that's, that's how you, I mean, the goal is that people will say like, well, if I did it this way, is that really me doing like a nature check? Um, mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and really trying to think about their characters. And, I mean, to a certain degree, it's like trying to figure out how to make the thing that you're good at apply to the situation. But, I mean, mm-hmm. usually that requires, like, thinking about your character and a lot of times, like, your backstory and, and who your character has been and why they would know certain things or do things a certain way. And so that's always fun. And it also just lets people have a better chance at succeeding and it doesn't guarantee they're going to succeed, but it does like help people succeed and people like succeeding it makes you feel better as a player. I mean, it is kind of like real life, right? Like if you're good at something and you think maybe that thing you're good at can help you solve the problem at hand, you're probably going to try that thing first. And then yeah. if you're like, well, actually, I think I need a doctor and I'm not a doctor, you know, <laughs> Then maybe. Hey, it didn't stop y'all from removing shrapnel from my person. Right. <laughs> <You know. laughs> or attempting to. And it so, I mean, uh, that would... <laughs> was not a good idea. No. I mean, that would Arguably. be a, a piece of advice I would have for people who are thinking about GMing, whether it's one shots or ongoing <laughs> campaigns. Is When it comes to things like skill checks and stuff, just be flexible. Be willing to let people make an argument. And if it makes any sense, like, just take it. Let them roll with it. I mean, if they make that check and they otherwise might have failed it, I mean, your your story shouldn't hinge mm-hmm. on, on a single skill check. On a single like skill check, so much that like <laughs> them making it is now all of a sudden like a big problem, um, sort of thing. Yeah. And and honestly, in a, a lot boat. of this, unless it's a boat, because um, if you mm. if you miss that skill check, then we all topple. Yeah, I'll topple. Um, yeah. Did anyone do a count of uh, overboard falling? I never fell overboard. I definitely know I was wet a lot because I was bailing yes. for like most of the game. But I would, I never actually fell in the water. I thought it was like <laughs> five or six. I don't. I yeah, didn't actually. Like I mean, that. I didn't count, but I, I definitely remember it was I mean, many times. And her oil. I mean, I was some people dove in. in. Yeah, I went are, in are we several counting? times, never on purpose. Are we counting times that people were already in the water and failed to get back in the boat? <laughs> Ooh, there's also those, and then there was the voluntary diving mm-hmm, in yeah. after the captain. Yeah. It's, it's a not a good thing. idea. Have to, have to go rewatch, rewatch yeah. the, yeah. re- re-roll and those. you can rewatch the... them on our VT Libraries YouTube channel, which is linked yep. in the about section of the Twitch. So you can also watch them. What I 
I had to find it. So I, I watched part of it before we started streaming. Um, uh, very small amount. Um, uh, mostly to find out if I had a last name for real. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, I, I realized that when you go to all videos, you have to like then go to another drop down and then like reconfirm all videos to be able to get to the backlog. But do the videos, how many videos can we have in our backlog before? They'll stay for two weeks on Twitch uh, unless we highlight them, which we've been doing some of uh, unless we can become a uh, what affiliate, right? Yeah. That's the first level. So, uh. yeah. I mean, Trevor, you probably could have just, just asked Kayla or I. We usually, well, Kayla takes great notes. I took uh, three whole notes in this game. I mean, I have some. Which was fewer, but I had five back. Uh, wow. backstory bullet points. So I had more backstory than notes about the wow. game. I want to know what your I'm... three notes were. <laughs> I wrote uh, one injury from shrapnel because I felt like that was going to be important and it happened right at the start of the game because I was being foolish. It, it was important uh, although like I didn't keep <laughs> referencing it. It meant you started off with fewer points of constitution mm -hmm. to lose before you died. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I wrote uh two rowing colon one bail colon one lookout navigator because mm -hmm. I was like oh we have roles I need to know what those are <laughs> uh, yeah and actually to be fair it was not three notes it was two and those were my two oh, notes wow. I'm more confused about why Kayla has multiple pages that's what I'm really surprised to see <laughs> I just, that is... there's some I took notes chronologically <laughs> You know, she was going to give everyone a performance <laughs> review after the journey <laughs> started on the first night where there was a half moon you know you have to have the most important information documented for later. Wow. You just said that, and I was like, I said there was a half moon. Hm. You did. <laughs> Look Night, at me. Half moon, open ocean, in there. far from land, yeah. very cold <laughs> water, ice. The waves were the hue of slate. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's from there the book. Go. That's what I wrote down. I wrote down <laughs> things from the that's book your note. that I thought we could that's, use. That's, that's your note. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I was That's like, because there was a quote that I really wanted to do, but I don't think I, I chickened out because there's like a quote that he keeps saying over and over again. Um, the, the, if I'm going to be drowned, if I'm going to be drowned, if I'm going to be drowned, why in the name of the seven mad gods who rule the sea was I allowed to come thus far and contemplate sand and trees? And like that just keeps coming nice. back. So I like wrote that down and I sure. like practiced it and I was like, I'm going to drop this sometime and then it was over and i <laughs> forgot <laughs> interestingly enough that is an important quote from the story oh yeah yeah that and is, that, that was one is... that gets thrown out in all the mm -hmm. all the classes of like and because it sure. sort of illustrates a lot of the it's a great quote stuff. Yeah. yeah that is a good transition into talking a little bit more about the work itself so Ooh. jonathan Whoops. if you could put on your uh literature Sit professor back. hat uh <laughs> can you tell us push up your glasses <laughs> right. no i'm gonna do well actually yeah. Uh, so i mean I'm... <laughs> yeah brief description of the work and a little bit about kind of the context around you know when it was published and why so it's a it's a short story by stephen crane it was written around um i think it was published in like 1897 or something like that right before 1900s um it was <laughs> did you take <laughs> other literature nerd is like i know what you're the <laughs> i'm not good with dates so like if He's i remember if, if i remember a date for a book like it was one someone told me a bunch um <laughs> and uh and it was it's a long short story so a lot of short stories are significantly shorter than this one but um it is uh a story about it doesn't actually start where we started they are already on the open boat they i started you on the ship because i wanted to give you a chance to one get injured i didn't want to force anyone to be injured yes. i wanted to you're welcome you're, thanks i mean i did i would have been sad if nobody got injured, mm -hmm. but i wanted to give you a Walked chance right into it for you and i also wanted to give you a chance to build up some resources or just do some general role playing with the boat because I knew, um, since it was a one shot, if I dropped you straight into being already on the boat, someone would have been like, "Well, I would have grabbed some food," and this meant I nobody really could say that because I would have been like, "Well, you didn't grab any food, or <laughs> or you did grab food, <laughs> like good work, um, sort of thing." And spices. Some people right. grabbed food and spices. Grabbed food and spices. <laughs> 
Um, but they do already start on the boat, and um, otherwise the context is pretty similar. Uh, it's actually surprisingly similar, um, which I'll get to in a second because I find it really fascinating. Um, <laughs> it's about these four men um, on a very small boat on a very dangerous ocean, and they are in a very precarious position. The water is very, very cold. They will They would die in it in a very short period of time, and they are trying to get to shore. And they are taking turns rowing. They're taking turns bailing. Um, the captain in the story is the one who's injured, not the correspondent. Um, and the, so the captain doesn't row uh, for that reason. But our correspondent did, even the <laughs> correspondent was tougher mm-hmm. than, than the book's captain. Um, yeah. And our captain still didn't row, but not because <laughs> they were They injured. were not, not very do it. strong. <laughs> General yeah. stoicism. Yeah, um, <laughs> and they're trying to make it to shore, and I mean, they, it was explicitly they, their flaw. I'm just saying, physically weak. Yeah, explicitly, it, is, it was the explicitly flaw the flaw that of they the, had of the so. character. Continue, and please. they they come across some conflicts and and trouble along the way. But one of the things that's very important about it is they all maintain a strong sense of like brotherhood. They are supportive of each other. They don't really fall to bickering. Um, they trade off turns and are, are very sort of kind to each other. Um, and ultimately, the same thing happens in the book. They, they make a mad dash for the shore once they've sort of been inside of it for a while. And uh, the oiler does not make it, but the other characters do. Um, I just spoiled the work. That's not what you're supposed to do when you're trying to spoiler alert. Right, yeah, when you're trying to encourage people to read (laughs) books, you just do a spoiler. I mean, there's hard for us not to do spoilers when the very nature of the game was a spoiler because y'all actually ended up. And I think I mentioned that during the stream was that Mm -hmm. the same character died. Um, But uh, getting into a little bit. For some more spoilers. And for the same reason. Yeah. And for the same reason. Yeah. Yeah. For the same reason, yeah. Like the same long running reason. Yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, essentially, the oiler is the strongest character out of the four, uh, and they make a big deal about that. And because of that, the oiler continually takes sort of extra shifts rowing and gets tired. And by the time they make their mad dash, despite being the strongest, is, is the one who drowns because he's tired, he's exhausted. Um, and that's exactly what happened in the game was behind the scenes there were exhaustion points and you would lose them based on um, you know times you spent rowing or doing something strenuous and uh, Griffin's character did far more rowing than anyone else and spent more time on the oars and by the time you got to the end of it and you had to make that swim he did not have enough points to make it to shore and so he, he passed away under the waves. I well, I will also jump in and say, game mechanics wise, I remember you mentioned something about that. I think at the very end about exhaustion points. Um, this might have been off stream, but you mentioned the exhaustion points and kind of constitution points and all of these other the the back end mechanics of things. Um, and you said something about how one of us is also really close to going if we had gone into the cold water like one more time. And I was like, yep, that was me. I literally didn't even think about it. I mean, I should have, <laughs> it was the book and that's yeah. how games work. And it still didn't even really occur to me that like, Oh wow. He was tired because he spent all of that time rowing just like the book. Yeah. Well, and that was the thing too. Like I spent a lot of time, my character spent a lot of time bailing and you know, there was never a mechanism where Jonathan was like, oh, you shouldn't be doing mm-hmm. that. And it wasn't until we were talking about things later on that, you know, there there was a consequence for spending that much time in the water, like actively like mm-hmm. wet in the water, trying to get more water out of the boat. Because, um, yeah, I was the one who was like one point away from death. Yeah. Well. well, I mean, so you the the constitution the rules related to that was any time you spent in the water like you fell out of the boat or you were bailing which meant you were in the water bailing um you were losing one for every eight hour period that you had if you were on the boat and you had no constitution points i would have told you you feel yourself going into hypothermia you know if you don't get out of the water and stop bailing like something bad's going to happen to you Mm -hmm. um if you were in the water you died like if you had fallen off the boat yeah. and that was your time to hit zero because essentially your body went into shock and you could no longer swim. 
Um, and so you just drown under the waves. And you were very close because you spent so much time bailing, but mm-hmm. um, you you did end up pulling it out. I think you had one point left when you hit the shore. <laughs> yeah, that's what you said. Yeah, because you also took time rowing, which rowing didn't cost you constitution points. It only right. cost you exhaustion. So you, got, you and um, Trevor's characters both had a good balance, um, of like jumping back and forth. And so you, you both were sort of close, which was the intention. The intention was that everybody would be close to dying. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that maybe someone died because that's just sort of the nature of the book and what was fair. I will say the, the captain was nowhere near close to dying on any front. <laughs> <laughs> they did fall <laughs> in several times. Yeah. And and yeah. then you hung and out then, on the warm side of the and boat. And then hung out on the front of the boat, like, do to do to do Just <laughs> being a lookout. Yeah. Don't mind yeah. me. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so all yeah. of that was mechanics, and all of that is based on some aspects of the literature. So Stephen Crane is, is often touted as a naturalist, which is a, a very sort of ephemeral movement in literature. Um, it was actually sort of a pre ephemeral movement in philosophy and all the the various places that naturalism uh, reared its head. But a lot of times it gets acquainted to, it was very much tied to this idea of like the scientific method and understanding the world based on scientific method. And in literature, the idea, as it sort of got translated, depending on who you ask, Frank Norris was the big American like voice of naturalism in American literature at least, but um, depending on who you asked, it's it's sort of like literature as scientific experiment. Like you put, you observe people in the world and you observe like natural phenomenon and like the there's no, like it's, it's supposed to be like a counterpoint to romanticism that, you know, these ideas of like telling this, it's basically a counterpoint to all the other stories we've done. <laughs> like where, where it's like we're heroes and we've come to save this person who's gone beyond the mirror and it's magical land and all this sort of stuff where things are going to work out because you're the heroes. Like there are no heroes. The universe does not care about you, which was a frequent thing that Stephen Crane puts into both his poetry <laughs> and his like prose is this idea that like you are owed nothing by the universe that surrounds you and you are just here existing and sort of like whatever happens to you happens and that's just how and it's it's, it's this idea his, of like observing phenomenon his least popular children's book <laughs> you are owed nothing <laughs> the universe doesn't care about you <laughs> yeah uh, i mean that seems about right has anyone the realism has anyone Stephen Crane. <laughs> <Right. laughs> um if Stephen Crane wrote children's stories, right. yeah. I mean he has a he has a poem that's literally like um, I'm going to butcher it because I, I won't quote it directly, but the poem is essentially the man said to the universe, "I exist," and the universe responded, "True," but that does not instill in me a sense of responsibility or obligation, mm. sense of obligation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's real, real happy writer, yeah, there, Trevor. Yeah. If you want to read some more Stephen Crane, yeah, I should. I'll, I'll, I mean, I love I, I love his poetry. <laughs> Maybe, he is, you know, later. That doesn't surprise me at all. Not now. No, it, yeah. I, 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 those of you who know me and work with me, probably that's not surprising at all. But, um, <laughs> yeah, he is one of my favorite poets, if not my favorite poet. Um, he is primarily known for his literature, though, his, his prose. Um, his poetry, while it shows up in a lot of, like, anthologies of poems and stuff, is not really... Like Stephen Crane's not Stephen Crane's not known as a poet. He's known for writing the Red Badge of Courage and Mag Air Girl of the Streets and the Open Boat and all these these works of prose, um, which is I think, I mean I get it. His stuff is depressing and it's weird and it's also not, it's not like a lot yeah. of other poetry. It's not generally lyrical in nature and it's very um, it's very abstract and metaphor driven. Like it's here's a weird image and you can tell there's like a a message behind it um like the story of the stone that that rolled down the hill all that stuff. i can tell it I, I know a lot of his poetry i know a lot of his prose <laughs> i see her talk to you about it for a long time um so i will has s- anyone changed the name of the stream yet to welcome to jonathan's ted talk about Stephen right. Crane's poetry <laughs> i mean can't we just, just name all of the roll yeah. calls that i gm to like welcome to jonathan's ted talk about blank yeah yeah, I think I mean, that's like, <laughs> Doctor yeah. Bradley owes you nothing. 
I like that one. Except better. his thoughts on yeah. on yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you're going to get his thoughts on right. X. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, was you which is, which really sets up how generous you are. Yeah. yeah. Like Doctor Bradley owes you nothing, but then you come, and then it's just this wealth of information that you're giving for free and from love. That's right. Yeah. But I mean, yes. I, yeah. so I say all that stuff and I guess the the mechanics of the story are are, are a, an attempt, my attempt to express like a naturalistic thought process. So I made a bunch of rules and they were based on your decisions and they were based on a little bit of randomness of the world around you, which was made the form of dice rolls. And then literally whatever happened, happened. And they were a little brutal because often the world is brutal. And, and quite honestly, a lot of Stephen Crane's work is quite brutal um, in terms of mm-hmm. sure. what happens to people. And there's, it's, not a, it's not a really like a happy ending sort of – he's not a happy ending sort of writer. Um, mm. So, yeah. I mean, you could yeah. argue that, you know, a bunch of more, – more people survived the open boat than died. But it's still sort of like – it's 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 intended to be more. There is a movement that is sort of runs counter to naturalism that was like realism, and um, in a way, I argue sometimes that naturalism is pretty realistic in that it is just this depiction of well, this is what the world would happen. But the, yeah, the the rules and all that stuff I put in pl- were an attempt by me to see if I could mimic that and make this world that is. A little dangerous for everybody, but could be survived <laughs> and is going to depend a lot on the choices you make and a little bit of randomness about what's going on in the world at any given point in time. One yeah. one thing that you did that really fit that and that I saw in the book, um, reflecting on it through this lens, the, um, what I remember of the book, um, there's the moment where they get to, again, you know, spoilers, we're just ruining the whole book, but mm-hmm. you should read it or listen to it like I did. It's fun. It won't take you long. Do it on a walk. Um, it's getting nice outside, you know? <laughs> anyway. Um, Get out for an hour. There's listen hot, to hot the Hot takes from back. Trevor. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I actually listened to it at like almost 2x speed as well. So really it's like 45 minutes, you know. Uh, but um, yeah. so um, uh, there was one part where they're like approaching the shore and they can see people. And they feel like they can see people seeing them. And they starts getting into oh here we go they're gonna they're gonna rescue us they're just gonna get a search party together um, you know and it's just there's this all all of that kind of thought like just this this hope of like we can hang on a little bit longer and a lot of times in just like more I guess classic what I would think of as classic kind of fiction or like the hero's journey kind of stories you end up with those moments and the characters are right. There are mm-hmm. people that are coming to save them. There might be an obstacle in the way that the, the other people have to get over. And that's what kind of builds the tension. But there's never any doubt that they're like, once they see that salvation is there, that they will get there. Uh, but that you that you're just denied that in the, the open boat. Like that's just not how he rolls. Um, and, um, <laughs> Uh, you did a good job of that, I think, with the the lighthouse and those waves of like there's just or the 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 yeah it was something like the, like the lighthouse where we rocks. had to make a decision yeah. of mm-hmm. we have to either try to cut through the danger or starve and go all the way a long way around and it was just like that lighthouse is not for you that's not what this is for that is not a finish line that is not salvation that is danger yeah. um, I mean lighthouses are like, dangerous oh, wow. <laughs> right. That's People true. forget that. They think of them as beacons and I'm like, that's literally there because this area is dangerous. Right. Dangerous. It's a it's like a don't go right, there. It's a giant warning symbol. Yeah. All right. Right. <laughs> so they're also I'm glad you brought that up. There is also y'all saw a person potentially on the shore. Because mm-hmm. that right. scene is important because I think it I mean it goes back to that poem. Like there's no obligation of the universe to rescue you, essentially. And that's uh, what like Stephen Crane's doing in that scene with this person on the shore that may or may not see them or may or may not even actually exist. It, it's led to believe, like, is this actually a person that they're seeing on the shore or not? Or is it just they're hungry, they're thirsty, they're tired? Mm-hmm. Like, is this, I mean, is it, could it be a dog? Sort of like, who mirage. knows what it is? Yeah. And so <laughs> I, I wanted to incorporate that. And so I actually had a plan. I was like, you got to make a roll to see if you see them to begin with. And seeing them is hard. Then I was going to have a, another role behind the scenes to see if it is actually a person. 
um, or if you are just seeing something and it's a dog or something. And then there, if that was successful and it was legitimately a person, then there was another roll to see if they actually saw you. <laughs> Um, so like your chances of them actually being able to do anything was pretty slim, like to send rescue to you. But that was part of the idea of like, this is a naturalist work and like, I should leave this to random instead of just saying for story reasons, this person, this is not a person or, or they're not going to come help you. Like I that- should give a chance that that is, hmm. that could happen. Um, and it didn't. Y'all saw them, but uh, they, I think it actually yeah. ended up being a person. Well, it's not that the not universe you. hates you. It's that the universe does not care about you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. Is yeah. it utterly a different and doesn't see you? Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Which is. That's fair. Just like the words? sea is indifferent. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't care I mean, that's, about you. It's definitely an argument uh, that you could make that it is worse. <laughs> If they took a position, maybe it'd be better. Um, and I think the fact that the the play through turned out basically the same as the story is fascinating because I know we talked about Trevor listened to the story like shortly before we played. It had been maybe nine years, eight or nine years since I'd read it. Um I, you know, I remembered the general context, but I did not remember exactly what happened. Um, And I don't know, Kira, how recently have you read The Open Boat? I had not read it in a long time either since probably my graduate work in, you know, when I had those American lit, those required American lit surveys because uh, I, of course, was the the British lit person, not an Americanist. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Kira and I, just for yeah. the record, Kira and I, uh, I my degree is specifically my track was in American <laughs> literature, and her her background is in British literature. So, yeah, I take whatever chance I can to boo her. <laughs> it's fine. I accept this, just because I wanted to study the cool stuff. Right, the cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Some First of off, let's be clear: depressing. none of us are studying the cool stuff. <laughs> that's true that's true if you're uh, I went to animation and, school. like i'm sure all all the Eng- i was gonna say no no i think that the qualification there was english majors we all know we're not mm-hmm. studying the cool i mean stuff. i'm just gonna throw this out there max is designing rockets <laughs> if we're talking about who's fair. studying the cool stuff that's fair that's true uh that's true i'm not designing rockets i studied children over like you know, children's lit and Victorian poetry, you know, it's not cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's a niche market for <laughs> nerdy people. Yeah. But I mean, it is also enjoyable. And there's a an inherent true. value to literature that I think is overlooked a lot. Um, but I, yeah. uh, that reminds me, I also thought it was interesting that the story ended up the same way as the book, because there is sort of this implication of naturalist fiction that it is an experiment mm. that you put people in a, like you put the characters in a situation and they are the phenomenon that you observed. And so like scientific, the scientific method runs on the idea of replication of results that you, you do an experiment, you find out what the results are and then someone else replicates those exper- those results by doing the same thing and seeing if they get mm-hmm. the same results. So in a really weird way, we took the, the scientific experiment of naturalism to the next step of the scientific yeah. method of we like proved and, and reproducibility. Some, right, yeah, we proved yeah. reproducibility. If you put four sailors in this situation and under these circumstances, this is, you get the same results. The open boat has been scientifically proven to be accurate. Wow. I know. That's, what a, that's a, a new mm. theory of literature. That's yeah. a that's yeah. a thesis waiting the waiting open to be boat. written. Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, and I mean, a, it is important to note, and I, I don't know that we've mentioned this yet, that this was based on some experiences that Stephen Crane had. Yeah. Mm. So it was already based on some actual experience. True. He's, <laughs> yeah. he's the right. correspondent. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the story. Wow. That's true. Wow. That actually, that leads into one of the other questions that we typically try to touch on. Is there other representations of this in media like Mm. are we aware of any and if anyone watching is aware of 
I don't know, a short film or something that I have not heard about, uh, you know, definitely put that in the chat. Yeah. Um, Life of Pi. I mean, I feel like it's a theme. Yeah. yeah, as a theme, it has to be out there. Yeah. But are there specific representations of this story? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Many. I mean, so a lot, anything that's like a classic work of literature, there's almost always someone who's done some sort of mm-hmm. like TV Adaptation. show yeah. or movie or something based on it just because like a lot of teachers look for them to like show them in class and stuff whenever they're going over um, a particular work. So mm. I feel part of me is like I feel like it's got to be out there but I don't know that I've ever come across it Mm. Jonathan are you up for uh, a preamble if a teacher wants to show our uh, role of play (laughs) of the open boat to their class yeah Yeah. I thought you might be (laughs) (laughs) well and I feel like in terms of film there's kind of two choices with this you're it's either like a black and white film from like the 30s yeah sure that or or it's like a you know high production contemporary movie with like wild sorts of effects and things like mm-hmm. that like it's either literally they filmed like a bunch of guys in a boat in a river but mm-hmm. pretended it was the ocean in the 1930s or <laughs> I really was hoping right. that you were going to say it's it's a, either a movie like the 1930s in black and white or it's a movie in black and white shot in the night like 2010s <laughs> I mean, actually, it probably would be. It would be like high production values, but like Mm -hmm. black and white artsy film. A lot of shadow. Color that would be disappointing. I think you could do it as a. um, uh, um, This goes back to like we the skills that we have. We're gonna try to roll and apply first. Um, But I was gonna say I think it would actually be a good animated short. Um, Yeah, I was thinking, Trevor, you want to animate it for us? I mean, because I think that could get, you know, 12 to like, you know, 10 to 12 minutes would probably be enough to get kind of those, those hit those highlights. Um, uh, (laughs) I think what I just heard Trevor say is we could have played this game in 12 minutes. (laughs) Why did it take us four hours? No, because like, I mean, just like, Mm. well, you don't want to watch an hour and a half because like so much that's that's one thing that i always find interesting between the translations of a book to a a a movie or screen um especially if the book is um like where where the main character is in their own head a bunch or Mm -hmm. like they're highly intellectualizing the situation that's really hard to depict in film um Mm -hmm. so uh a short story where you know you're talking about other media a short story where a character is just sort of like thinking through his final existential thoughts and that's where it's this short also um if you like condense this the way that you might for a uh, fiction into an hour and a half movie this like proportionally the same amount of compression mm-hmm. would like compress the open boat down to like 10 minutes because right. you're just not going to have that opportunity to get all those intellectualizing and existential moments um well, uh, Bernard's thoughts yeah. about ham sandwiches and pie right, would not. Right, and yeah. we, and it we would all have, have to be. <laughs> 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 it would just be like the like yeah, uh, just, the main the main character just c- continually saying that same like if I'm going to be drowned if I'm going to be drowned that like, that whole like quote. Like, but it would no be better that watch way. that for an hour and a half. It would be more thematically accurate. I mean, it would probably be be a better experience to have gone through an hour and a half. That's just like an animated version of the audiobook. Yeah. I mean, I'm always really annoyed when people make adaptations and they spend too much time having the characters like drive home themes and stuff from the work. Like, I. So, this is one of my things I bring up a lot. I feel like Kayla already knows what I'm going to mention, but. One of the things that when it comes to literature and media that I bring up a lot is one of my favorite scenes from Futurama. There is the robot devil and he jumps up on stage during like Fry's performance and he says, you can't just have your characters say how they feel. That makes me angry. And I feel like yep. robot devil a lot <laughs> whenever I see a lot of like adaptations mm-hmm. of books and stuff because they're trying too hard to tell you what is in you got from the book from reading you know but like you you read a lot more and spent a lot more time with it and you picked up on these things but like visual like visual works are a different medium and Mm -hmm. you can yes you're spending more time with a book in most situations to read it or a short story or something than you are to watch a movie or an episode of a television series but you're also getting a lot more data 
You're getting a lot mm -hmm. more information. And you should be relying on that because if you're not relying on that other influx of information, you're never going to be able to capture what was captured in that book. But if you utilize all the other aspects of it well, you can. I think that's, that's, uh, there it requires a level of, um, if I may be so bold, um, film literacy <laughs> where you really need to sit there and, um, uh, be able to interpret and actively, um, like actively be re responding to and reading the text of mm -hmm. the, the, the movie that you were receiving. I think a lot of times it's so much easier, especially in, I see in chat a great suggestion for a modern multi-million dollar production with a romance subplot. Um, mm, I hate yeah. that. I think that would be fantastic. <laughs> yeah. You know? Ouch. Well, it, 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 all, it, it, all, it, out. it all goes, it all goes <laughs> south when the bird comes in and steals the bread. And then like, mm -hmm. they're like, what do you even do? Um, mm -hmm. You know, and then the moment happens with like, you know, I will, I'll split my last piece with you. And then it's like, wow, what a connection. But the boat's real small. That so everybody potato, sees it that potato lasted us a long time. Sure. Hey. But, I was a um, generous so, with the potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> you were. So you have this moment where you're, you know, you're into the theater and you're just getting like, sometimes um, I can tell in, when I'm watching a movie, sometimes I can tell like, I'm just supposed to be getting information beamed into my brain. Like I don't need to be actually interpreting any of this. I don't need to be an active reader of the text. I'm just going to receive this information because that's all the thought I need to have. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes things like the open book, I'm like, how much of this am I supposed to be taking as a metaphor? Are they all already dead? Is that ever the answer? Is this a dream? Like, I, you know, I just like <laughs> right. all of is those this questions. Hell? Right. right. Is I this mean, like, hell? how many yeah. times Dude. have they been on this boat? I mean, yeah. the occurrence of Al at Owl Creek Bridge is what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Ambrose. Yeah. It's Ambrose Bierce, right? Bierce. Yeah. Yep. Um, Ambrose Bierce. Yep. Guy is like being hung for crimes and he like the rope break, the tree branch breaks or the rope breaks at the last second and he like escapes and people are chasing him. And then like at the end of the story, they're like, oops, actually you just died. You just dreamt all that stuff. Also another spoiler for a story that we didn't. <laughs> play. I know. Wow. <laughs> just spoilers left and right tonight. Oh just, although I don't, I, Ooh, that would be one to, mm, I don't know about adapting that. One. Yeah. That one's, yeah. I mean, that one's harsh because it starts with a hanging, which is right, not yeah. a, and technically never leaves that. And technically right. never leaves that hanging either. <laughs> it's not good. Yeah. Someone Probably with no power not. in the situation, hard veto. Um, <laughs> mm. But yeah. so, yeah. But to your point, you were saying that um, <laughs> going before way back we around, start talking about uh, hanging. Uh, <laughs> we, Where did we start? We Jonathan was talking about how um, there, um, the, the TV or movies, the, is the visual medium. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, is, a, is a different medium it needs to be kind of engaged although similarly um, it needs to be in, like for, or rather you engage it for similar reasons but you engage it in a different way and so there's a ton of information that can be packed in it um, uh, if you're kind of like asking those questions as you go and thinking about what you're watching as you go um, mm -hmm. so yes I think you, you can have a movie where a character is intellectualizing a lot and they're, you're just relying a lot on the performance of the face and the language of the camera um, but yeah it would be interesting if not. someone wants to make a short film about the open boat you know send us a link yeah yeah <laughs> and you can actually you have an that. audience um, that's, and that's a great segue to a plug that no one asked for uh, for the Media Design Studio. Uh, all of the equipment you would need to create such a short film is available to you at lib.vt.edu forward slash bookings. Um, Trevor is on point with those plugs. That's right. <laughs> Trevor is always on point with those. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is true. And we have uh, workshops if you, for audio yeah. and for video. Mm -hmm. That's that is true. 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 If you are a member of the VT community, faculty, staff, or student, you can borrow the equipment and take it on location. We'd prefer if you didn't take it on an open boat in the middle of the ocean, mm. but also, you know, you're legally responsible for it once you take it from us, so you could. Um, and if you're, you can get it back within the I checkout mean, so period. I will say they a lot of that equipment has been in more precarious places. So. It has been in a lot of places <laughs> filming some cool and interesting stuff and maybe scary stuff, you know. I know, in caves I know at least, a, I know um, at least of a handful of cameras that made their way into some caves. Yeah. 
Which uh, is and awesome. if you're a member of the community and not officially Virginia Tech faculty, staff, or student, you can come in and film on a green screen background in Media Design Studio B and, you know, superimpose in your own boat. Just like Life of Pi. <laughs> Wow, this show took a turn. And that's how they made Life of Pi. I'm just saying, like, just do that. It's it true. was good enough for the Academy. Like, you could do that. Can so, you say I mean, that with true. such like venom? Like, you got a personal vendetta against the Life of Pi. It was good enough was, for the Academy. I'm just saying, it's good enough for you. Um, yeah. Oh my yeah. goodness! Let's see uh, here. You can even put up a learning glass, and then you could do what Jonathan doesn't want you to do, and then just like write on the learning glass what the point of the shot is. Like we're yeah. now, we feel sad. Yep. Arrow. I don't do that. This this Arrow. person bad is story. Sad. <laughs> sad. Yeah. yeah. This makes me feel sad. <laughs> this <Yep>. conversation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Can't just can't just tell people how you feel. Uh, the <laughs> irony of that is, in real this, life, you should tell people how you feel. <laughs> that's true. In in media, mm. you want to show, but in reality, but, that's also. That's also not what this show is for. But also tell people how you feel. You to be yeah. honest about yeah, your how feelings. How did we we are we are all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> That's mm. also true. Um, which the it, dangers of studying American literature, John. Is true. Are these dangers? <laughs> I mean, I think we talked about like exploring your options for a creative output and also like good mental health practices mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. talking about your feelings these all seem like positives to me i'm just gonna throw yeah. that out there yeah. <laughs> let's next talk a little bit about expectations were there the things game. that you expected to be in the work um or from the work that you expected to be in the playthrough that weren't uh there's less to pull from so maybe maybe there is maybe there isn't anything um and then the flip side of that for jonathan was there anything you expected the players to do that we didn't do uh i mean i I didn't oh yeah go for it no no i'm sorry no go for it trevor okay Uh, i i was just gonna say i actually kind of the reverse i expected that there would be few i expected that it wouldn't be um, quite as much of the book in the game. I assumed that, like I said, mermaids or something. I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. Sirens. <laughs> more <something>. fantasy. <laughs> um, I was expecting, just because that's m- more of my RPG sort of background, but also, again, because I wasn't sure how we would stretch this into a full kind of one shot. Um, and I would say that um, I was sort of delighted at how much came um, from the book into the game. The only things that I think were um, uh, I was expecting to see, but it wasn't, was more of that interaction of um, the people on land and Mm. more of the interaction of, um, uh, I don't know how I thought Jonathan as the the, uh, DM or or GM would have gotten this in there, but more like existentialism on our part. (laughs) <laughs> so I don't know why I was like, Ugh, Jonathan didn't have me have existential dread. Like, <laughs> I don't know how what would have prompted that. But um, uh, um, but there's still, but there was at the end. So I mean, it did it did creep in. Um, but I think that was the other one. And then I think that was it. I I really liked the the fact that there was so much, um, and I and I liked the fact that we kept falling into in line with what was happening in the book as well. I thought you were going to say falling in the water. I really liked that we kept falling <laughs> in the water. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, that was a bad idea. Yeah. And that like mm-hmm. didn't really ever happen in the book, right? Did that happen once maybe? I don't think it actually happened. Or in the actually, book. I don't think it I think, at all. I, I mean, I think the implication in the book is if anybody fell in, like it's done-so for everybody. <laughs> did I just mm. say done-so? Mm. I hate myself for mm-hmm. that. You, you did. did that. Yeah. Well, and I think we're done. No. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I think we're done-so. <laughs> <laughs> done-so. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Um, well, I would say, like, was there, knowing, having a little bit of experience with the story, like, um, was there anything that I expected to show up but didn't know? But I don't mean that as a boring answer. Like, I don't mean that, like, oh, Jonathan should have thrown more at us or what. I just mean it in the sense that, like, it is a minimalist story mm-hmm. and he worked with what, what there was. And instead of bringing in new, found creative ways to deal with that. And I think, mm. so I wasn't, like expecting something that didn't show 
but it doesn't mean it wasn't enjoyable mm-hmm. or like interesting to play. I mean, maybe it wasn't enjoyable because it was, you know, naturalism. Right. <laughs> What's not enjoyable about naturalism? I don't understand. It was too American. We've been over this. It's it's um, not always enjoyable to role play someone dying in a boat, is what I'm saying. That's true. No one and died yet. in the boat. Yeah, you all died in the ocean. Fair enough. We didn't that's die always, at all. And that's all fun to role play. Always fun. Um, right. Dying in the ocean, right. way more fun to role play. Yep. No. Uh, I mean, I didn't expect y'all to try to sail around those rocks. Uh that was that was a hot debate. Yeah, it was a hot debate. <laughs> I was like, I thought I made it clear that this is too far for them to go and survive, but maybe you not. Yeah, I did not feel <laughs> like it was outside of the realm mm-hmm. of possibility. Yeah, I was like, yeah. I mean, maybe they're too confident because they got those potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely we had so much food, so it definitely seemed way mm-hmm. easier to just we had, go we had around. Like a potato at that point, Trevor. Yeah. A potato. Yeah, I was looking <laughs> so at y'all much. stats. No more, no more gull because someone did an awful job cutting it up. <laughs> but I think in the book they had no food. That was like, yeah. they had nothing the whole time. So the fact that we had even one potato, I was like, we're fine. Like, we could just like, we could just hang out. Like if you guys, if you just want to wait a day. We are kings we of the sea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Behold right. my potato. Yeah. Um. I did. I really like I didn't expect that we were going to start on the boat um, on the original ship. Um, And I really like that as like an opportunity for us to either like help ourselves out or screw ourselves over. But like Mm. either way, it was our decision. Uh, Mm -hmm. There was no like being put upon (laughs) like, you know, I mean, as you would expect with naturalism like yeah yeah mm. i tried to make sure you understood that there wasn't really an opportunity for you to save any other members of the boat because i was worried yeah. about somebody being like i'm gonna go like rescue bob and i'm like no but none of us did that no. well none I, of us even thought about that that's well i did say <laughs> that y'all, room. i did say yeah. early on when i was doing the description that you would be aware that an explosion of this magnitude yeah, everyone that's else's that's the people said. who were up operating the ship are probably dead um you didn't really check on them, but that's fine. I, I mean, I told you that so that you had you understood. I mean, and they were they were dead okay. already. Just okay, for good. like, well, because what's that scenario if we found another survivor? Oh, now we got five people. Then we I have an NPC I didn't prepare. For. That's also yeah. true. Who also was not going to fit in that and boat? Also not going to fit in that boat. <laughs> that no. is something. That is something that's interesting to between like the that interplay of like if you're playing a game that you know, um, or playing like a a game based on literature that you know so i didn't even think about yeah checking to see if there's anybody else both because of your like intro but also just because there's no one else in the boat in the book and like i if you were supposed to be there you should have been there like you know uh, so <laughs> it was there way like, we were the main characters yeah, yeah. i blew up all the boat. i knew was like you you had to start for a reason and then i was like i'm a cook i love ham sandwiches i love spices we're going to need food because they didn't have any and that seemed real hard. So that's I'm going to go get some. And yeah. if I don't make it, well, that's fine. This is a one shot. So I also <laughs> rolled for like, like you successfully rolled to not hurt yourself, which meant you were successful mm-hmm. at getting the thing you were wanting. But I did roll to see how many you found and you got really lucky on that because my expectation was that you would get like maybe one or two potatoes, but you ended up with like three or four. I don't remember how many. Um, and I was like, well, three potatoes. Yeah, shirts, <laughs> also, and some potatoes. rolls, <laughs> and some bread, and some bread. and yeah. spices. Yeah. yeah. Also, think how awkward it would have been, Trevor, if in fact you had died while trying to get the food, and you just had to sit there for the rest of the stream <laughs> quietly. Oh, it would have turned into, <laughs> but then it would have turned into a ghost story, and it would have been great. Dying would have <laughs> been really, by the really cook. hard though, because yeah. you just every injury you got took two yeah. points off your constitution, so you would have had to have been like continually going yeah, back. I'm gonna go with back. Major. Again. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Bernard was. If Bernard but, only got one potato, would he have been motivated to go back for more? Probably. It's like, well, yeah, I, I mean, have. I mean, that makes. Sense. I already have three serious injuries. <laughs> I'm just gonna go <laughs> back into it. But spices, but spices and pie. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, definitely getting multiple injuries could have ensured that you probably like I, if if any one of you aside from the captain had taken another injury, I don't think you would have survived. Um, mm. mm-hmm. I mean, the oiler <laughs> yeah. already didn't survive. Well, the captain could have probably survived because the captain had great, great points at the end. 
Yep. Mm-hmm. I mean, yep. And no better time than now to transition into looking forward and not looking at the captain anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we've got we've got about five ish minutes left. We got started a little bit late, so we've we've got um, we can take a little bit longer than that. But that's we're coming up on the half hour. So I want to make sure we have time to talk about other works of literature that are coming up um, and things. Um, So first question that we typically try to touch on, are there other works of literature that you would recommend uh, to give a similar experience to the open boat if folks are just really want more naturalism uh, and sadness? You know, is there anything that you would recommend? I was trying to think of like equivalents in other harsh environments. Um, so like what stories are there about like survival in a desert or Call of the Wild. Jack yeah. London was a naturalist. Um, most everything yep, he, Jack L- most yeah, everything he wrote there. is depressing being um, in nature, getting mm-hmm. someone or something killed. <laughs> there are for sure aspects of some like H. Ryder Haggard works that have those elements as well although there's a little bit more of the fancy storytelling and not not the isolation aspects of it yeah. um i mean the red badge occurs but those are sort of jungle based that's the easy one yeah i mean it is i mean sp- sp- this isn't really a spoiler because you find out like right at the beginning of the book but the red badge is a bullet wound <laughs> um mm-hmm. it is <gasps> <laughs> all the yeah, spoilers so jonathan all oh, the gosh. spoilers um, um yeah so for the question of what would what could give a similar experience and so i don't know about similar experience uh i think it i think it has the same vein and i'm gonna say this because i desperately would love to figure out a way to run a one shot i don't know that it's possible but i would love to is bartleby the scrivener <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Talk about that, like. Um, I would prefer not to play in that. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I would prefer not to. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> if I could figure out some, I think it's a great, it's a great mental uh, exercise to say, think about. But I would sh- not want to play in. I'm that. not sure if Trevor is frozen or very still, but then he blinked. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I'm just Bartleby very is great. listening. Yeah. <laughs> If I can figure out some way to turn that into a one shot that I think would be reasonably fun for people to play, I will 100% do it, but I don't. Mm. So in our, in our list list, I mentioned at the beginning of the spreadsheet or at the beginning of the podcast, there's a spreadsheet that we have that has like all these works (laughs) of literature. There are a handful of them that have like a special note that just says really hard, but would be really cool. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Essentially. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's some stuff on there. Like, I really want to figure out how to do the, the poetry of William Blake. How sure. do you turn that into a one shot? I don't know, but it would that be... I do want to play in. I don't care what you do, Jonathan. I want to play. Well, in I, I think if we did that, it would have to be like the Eurasian series of like poems and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Because I don't know that like the the Marriage of Heaven and Hell and um, Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience. That would be weird, but maybe I don't know. That's why it's marked as really hard but could really hard <laughs> uh but could be could be something that's cool but yeah Bartleby the Scrivener I love that story if there's a way I think it I think it encompasses a lot of things it's a different perspective and it's a different setting very different but I think at mm-hmm. the core of it the character Bartleby is experiencing a naturalist life like I, I think that's like him and that's what you're but you're seeing it from an outside perspective and so there's a little bit of that but yeah Hmm. yeah i think that's a good recommendation for sure um let's see here what about things that are coming up are there upcoming sessions that you are excited about well we didn't give trevor a chance to answer is there any oh yeah yeah, trevor do you have a a recommendation um, for literature or other media it yeah. could be we we throw out other know. media too sometimes yeah that is well i mean i mentioned life of pi a gajillion times so i guess yeah. you can see that um it's a fun movie um, i also was thinking of like the lighthouse i, I was thinking of um Oof. Castaway. Oh, what yeah. a fun movie what a rock <laughs> yeah. um mm. there's sort of two characters there um on the island um 
Yeah. <laughs> sort of. Uh, there's sort of a red badge. Um, I guess maybe. Not really. <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm making some stretches. But uh, yeah, I think in general, um, I'm thinking, yeah, like go like I'm thinking like watch Life of Pi or Castaway, one of these like shipwreck kind of movies where they are just kind of stuck thinking about the same existential like problems and um, thinking about it through the lens of what we talked about earlier of like actively reading um, what you're, you know, what you're seeing um, and uh, asking those same kind of questions. So I'm going to go with. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. (laughs) I realized I didn't mention Bartleby the Scrivener uh, is written by Herman Melville. I was like, we should Mm -hmm. probably talk about the authors of some of these works in case people are interested. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) So they're easier to locate. That's fair. Uh, I mentioned H. Ryder Haggard. Uh, His novels, he was actually the creator of Alan Quartermain. So if you're familiar with that character, who's represented in a lot of different forms of media, uh, actually originally created as the character in a series of late 19th century British novels, adventure novels, as they called them. There we go. Some Kira, great as recommendations. Much as, if as much folks as we go back in the and chat forth. have other yeah. recommendations, definitely put those in the chat on Twitch. We would love to see your recommendations. Yeah. <laughs> Kira, as much as we go back and forth about America versus <laughs> British, British literature, I'm really glad that you're involved in this project so that you can do a lot of the British literature that I don't want to do. <laughs> yeah. Except for William Blake, because that is where we have some. Oh, common yeah. Ground. William we Blake both, is amazing. Uh, love that. <laughs> love that crazy man. <laughs> Trevor's got you a should, finger I up. I should also note. Well, I should also note. I was talking about Life of Pi, the movie, a bunch because uh, it, I don't know, related, and that's 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 the nail to my hammer. Um, I, uh, um, but it is based on a novel, so you could just like I'll read the book, you know. Also, just wanted to throw that mm, out there. So in case we got comments. Pl- plug um, that there. So it's also mm, a book. You can do yeah. multiple. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but no worries, Jonathan. I have so many <laughs> British lit ideas that <laughs> in the chat it's an endless pool. We do have uh, let's see, figure out the library of Babel. Library of Babel. Yeah, that's a funny story. I that's mean, a... that one's also. I mean, that's that one's really good for a one shot though. So I mean, that's that's sort of already in keeping with some of the like fantasy stuff from even like the Forgotten Realms of like Watsy. because there's like a they just released a book about the Candlekeep. No, not Candlekeep. Mm-hmm. Library, the, yeah. The library one. Is it Candlekeep? Mm-hmm. Or am I thinking of, it is Candlekeep, am I thinking yeah. of that uh, copy pasta, scary pasta story? No, no, no. It's Candlekeep. It's, that's the Candle library. Candle Cove is the Candlekeep. copy pasta story. That's I really enjoyed that. Mm. Um, but yeah, Candlekeep, like the, the library. I mean, it was different. But I mean, the, the idea of like an adventure in a library and, um, and this special magical library at that. Um. Yeah, that would be a that would be a really good one. So, some uh, great ideas. Oh, so we were trying to we got distracted from the question of what's what's coming up yeah. that people are excited about. Oh. What is coming up, Jonathan? Oh, is that a question for me? Yeah. Yeah. So we got. <laughs> I was like, what a question do we get distracted from? So we have some works coming <laughs> What's up. What's coming up? Next week. We have Vada's War, um, which is by Elizabeth Moon. Um, and Anthony will be running that. Um, then we've got uh, Dante's Inferno is the next thing after that. So that's March 12th yep. is uh, Vada's War. So that's just that's next Friday. Um, yes. I don't know what day it is anymore. Pandemic time. <laughs> uh, then we've got Dante's Inferno by... The, the in, well, it's Inferno by Dante Alighieri. I don't know why I said it weird. I don't have an accent, mm. and I can't do accents. Just Inferno. That's what we'll call it. By Dante Alighieri. We're abandoning British and American literature for medieval Italian uh, yeah. literature. We're it's going first part of a three-part series. Off. We'll go for the whole Divine oh, Comedy. Oh no! Are we going to do the bad parts? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not. Thank doing you. Purgatorio and Paradiso. Um, <sighs> Unless we come up with a really cool story and it makes sense, um, mm. Mm. then maybe we'll, t- we'll think about it. <laughs> and then we're doing some Isaac Asimov. Um, mm-hmm. The name of the story, uh, crap, let me look at the list. 
Isaac Asimov. Uh, much later in the semester, I'm going to do another Sherlock Holmes. We just did Sherlock Holmes, but it is ripe for a part two. Mm-hmm. And I think people are game, yeah. pun intended, to do that. So later in the semester, we will do a Sherlock part two. And at some point, I'm going to run a game. I'm really waffling. It's either going to be another Honey Heist or possibly a comedic post-apocalyptic Deadlands campaign. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm really struggling to find the right piece of literature for that. So if people have ideas for not super sad post-apocalyptic literature, I'm open for suggestions. That does <laughs> seem like a narrow niche. Night- Funny would be even better, but <laughs> Nightfall, Nightfall yeah. is the is the work by Isaac Asimov and Robert Silverberg. Um, that's going to be in the Cipher system, and Anthony will be running that. Uh, and then, as Kira said, she's got a couple that she's uh, looking into running. I'm still I'm still Working waiting on, on that that Hobbit based uh, Honey Heist. I think I think we may have to commit to the Hobbit based Honey Heist this semester, and I can worry about a Dadlands mm. idea later on down the line. Because the more I think about it and the more I've talked to a couple of people about it, I think the idea of a, of a Hobbit-based honey heist might be the way to go. So maybe that's what it'll be. I am. I mean, so I lots of exciting still, stuff coming up. I hope it's still honey. <laughs> that the, oh, and I do want to point yeah. out Anthony's game next week is a new system for us. It's Lasers and Feelings, oh, yeah. as I recall. Mm, it is Lasers So it's a new system that has not been done on stream before. Yeah. So we're jumping around a little bit. We're trying to, you know, the one of the challenges we were thinking about when we started this like series of programming was we're going to have to jump around. And I, there was a period there where I was like, am I going to have to make up some sort of like zero character system where everybody's just yeah. normal people, but they have something to roll against? <laughs> uh, and I decided against making up some sort of system because that's a lot of work. Um and so we're just adapting and using whatever makes the most sense whenever it does. And we, we've run a lot of D&D stuff, and I, I think we will continue to run a lot of D&D stuff. But we're also, yeah. sometimes it just, sometimes a fantasy setting with complex character classes and all that sort of stuff just doesn't make sense for what we're doing. So we'll, we'll bounce around as needed, depending on what the work of literature requires. And the goal is every two weeks on Friday. So next week... Mm-hmm. We'll be here on Friday at 6 o'clock. Right, Jonathan? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and what's the next roll call? Next the roll next call is Alice roll call. Oh, right. Is what? Alice in Wonderland Part 2. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland Part 2. There you go. So that'll be glass. coming up. Nice. In two weeks. Two weeks We're from catching today. up. We're catching up with yeah. ourselves. We're right. only like two behind now. Mm-hmm. So we will be continuing to do this. Talk about literature. Uh, If you have uh, suggestions out there for works of literature that you would recommend that we try to adapt, particularly uh, post-apocalyptic, but not too sad things for Kira, uh, (laughs) definitely submit those to us. Uh, You can send them. I feel like I'm committing on the record. We're going to do Hobbit Honey Heist this semester, and we'll kick Dadlands the next semester. So So you've got lots of time to do research. To bring us your great suggestions, <laughs> please do. Uh, you can send them to rolleofplay-g at vt.edu. Uh, you can also put them in the um, in the chat on Twitch. Uh, you can also tweet them at us with hashtag VTUL roll call or hashtag VTUL roll of play. We'll be keeping an eye on those hashtags. So I'm going to throw this out there. Technically, technically... The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a post- post-apocalyptic piece of literature. <gasps> and there it is. Because <laughs> the, whole, there it the is. whole world's been blown up. <laughs> Spoilers. Gosh, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Problem solved. I might still push that one back because I think we want to commit to this honey heist with the Hobbit. I mean, but. Uh, second, we can call the session second season. <laughs> <laughs> I mean hear all these great ideas if you have great ideas we'd love for you to share them with us and we appreciate you hanging out with us this evening your ability to keep on plugging keep on keeping everything moving forward keeps us on track Kayla always keeps us on track no matter how much I try to derail everything yep (laughs) it's true and we're at the end of our time together this evening Um, there is one thing in the chat that I want to uh, note um, go for Argentinian literature was something that Rogan shared when we were talking about uh, other kind of similar pieces um, 
explore some Argentinian literature. I don't know exactly what he's talking about, specifics, but get out there and find something new. Read something. If you think it'd be cool to adapt for a one shot, tell us about it. I just had a r- or listen to it because some people like to listen. That's right. I just had a <laughs> right, Trevor? real serious like wishbone flashback. Like that sounded like the like the outro to the wishbone show of like literatures like in everybody's hearts, and you should go out and grab some, like explore something new. You'll find it. I don't. I don't know that literature is in everybody's hearts, but you should explore something new. And also, as we learned earlier, you should tell people about your feelings. So. <laughs> That's what we're going to end with. This <laughs> our <evening>. PSA. <laughs> That's our PSA. Thank yeah. you so much for hanging out, for watching Roll Call. Um, we are rating somebody, question mark, Jonathan? N- NCSU uh, libraries. They are yeah, in so. Tillbrush doing some art. Awesome. So cool. check check out Making another arts. university library doing some art. And thank you for hanging out with us this evening. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks. Bye. Bye. There we go. Mm -hmm. We're still up.